Welcome to the Business of Government Hour TV, a video companion to our flagship radio program. I'm Michael Keegan, your host. For almost two decades, the IBM Center for the Business of Government has sought to connect research to practice, engaging authors and academics who, in their research and studies, contribute in some form or fashion to changing the way government does business. This is a special edition of the Business of Government Hour, a conversation with authors, exploring ideas for improving government effectiveness with Professor Jim Hendler, author of Social Machines, The Coming Collision of Artificial Intelligence, Social Networking, and Humanity. What is artificial intelligence, AI, and how has it evolved? What are some of the challenges presented by AI? I'll discuss these questions and so much more. To take a look or take a listen, you can download the entire interview at businessofgovernment.org. Uh, Jim, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. My pleasure. So uh, I was wondering if you would give us a brief overview of the birth and evolution of artificial intelligence, AI. What uh, constitutes the core elements of AI, and how does it differ from the phenomenon of machine learning? Right. So um, what seems like an easy question is actually (laughs) has many, many roots, many complex things. Most people date, at least in America, the term artificial intelligence to a meeting that happened in 1956 held at Dartmouth where a number of people who were looking at this new computer technology and thinking about the issues of smart computers and, of course, when you consider how much further ahead our computers are today than they were 60 years ago, it's um, quite different. But these were real visionaries and were saying, you know, how could we explore – what we could learn about humans and how they think, or could we use humans to help us learn how to make computers do what we might call thinking. So the early work tended to be very um, broad all over the place. How do people solve problems? How do we do language? Things like that. And always one piece of that has been kind of the issue between Do we program things or do we learn things? And one of the early places where a good example of that comes in is playing games. So um, very, very early on, a computer program was written that um, basically learned to play checkers Mm -hmm. and was able to beat pretty much all the human opponents. But um, it was very, very specialized to, to learning checkers. It wasn't sort of generally learning about things. So there were people who were saying – but then there were other parts of the field. um, Nowadays, for example, if you use tax preparation software, a lot of that is based on what's called rule-based technology that came out of artificial intelligence of the 80s. Um, The military uses a lot for planning. Um, A lot of the AI is sort of embedded in applications and things. When Facebook chooses which things to show you and which ones not to, they're using AI technologies. Now, um, and of course, a big breakthrough was uh, the Watson program in 2011, which which beat Ken Jennings at the game of Jeopardy, which really got people very excited because that was a – That was a game that was thought of as a human thing, right? So chess, checkers, go, those feel like smart people do them, but they're artificial. Whereas this was, you had to know all sorts of stuff about all sorts of things to beat uh, Jeopardy. So, So a lot of the technique that was used is a combination of these different program things and these different ways of learning. So one thing you can do is program the computer to to learn. And then you give it the right kind of inputs and outputs and train it up and it learns sort of the map between them. So that's typically in a super easy sense what machine learning Mm -hmm. mostly is these days. And there's many types and things. So so one of the reasons um, AI has come you know, sort of into its own again, it happens periodically, is very much that this machine learning technology got much more powerful. There was much more data to train it on. So you couldn't have won Jeopardy without having Wikipedia to use as one of your knowledge sources because, of course, it knew about so many different things. It wasn't the only source. It had to know a lot of, a lot of other things too. So the so in a sense, machine learning is part of artificial intelligence. It's not the whole field. And I skipped the part about you know sort of the birth and evolution. And it's really been a um, 
it, to use a term from from the the biological literature, been a sort of punctuated evolution. So what has happened is some technique will become powerful. People will be doing things with that technique. There'll be a lot of excitement. You kind of come to the end of either what that technique can do or what the current generation of computing power can do, and it sort of falls away. And everyone said, is disappointed because they said, you know, it was supposed to be intelligent, right? So, you know, in a, in a few years, uh, a computer will be driving your car, and you'll say, oh, but it's not really intelligent. That's just driving. Whereas right now, it seems like it's a complicated thing because only humans do it. And and so the field is really trying to figure out uh, – somebody once said the best definition of artificial intelligence is what computers can't do yet. Yet. So like why, why did you call your book – or in a sense, I'm wondering where social machines comes from. Why and how do you use it? Sure. So um, so the term really has kind of three meanings and – has a long history. The, be- the best definition of it was actually in a book called Weaving the Web, which was written by Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web. Mm-hmm. And, and in the book, Tim, in a sort of late chapter, talks about the advent, and this was before Facebook, before Twitter, before anything, so, of systems where humans would provide the creativity, but the computer would provide sort of the bookkeeping, and that together this would be a very powerful social machine. So from that sort of three different definitions derived. So one is as you had things like Facebook and Twitter, I mean, people were saying, well, this is sort of humans are doing the stuff and the computer's doing the bookkeeping. So those are social machines. But in reality, really there, it's really more the computer just supporting communication between people doing less of the actual interaction, although that's part of what's changing now. Second one and the one we mostly focus on in the book is that because of these advances in AI and new technologies, the the computer is more and more coming into what we might call our social space. So you and I are having this conversation. We've actually put our phones in our pocket and turned <laughs> it off, which is an unusual act now. And you know, in a few years, not only will you be able to run apps and things, but your phone will be listening and be able to sort of chime in and say, you know, in the book you said this list of uh, – uh, so it, it can oh, actually God, that would be answer some of these questions <laughs> <laughs> instead of having this. Probably more question. dynamic than me. <laughs> and the question becomes when would you want that? When would you? So, so where are we kind of bringing them into the spaces which have been traditionally human? Where are they helping us? Where they, where might there be concerns and things like that? So that's really the one we mostly focus on. And then the third meaning, and this is one where, sort of wearing my research hat, I do more of, is going back to that original definition. How do we make it easier for for us to explore how to solve problems using not just one person and one machine, mm-hmm. but many, many machines and many, many people? So the network of machines and the network of humans are very different. But, for example, um, sometimes when you're trying to solve a problem, if you could only find the other person who knew a certain piece of stuff, that would be really useful. Right now, computers aren't really good at helping us do that, right? But you could imagine something that was kind of watching what I was doing and what you were doing and say, you know, you guys might want to talk about this or something like that. And and again, there are, these start with very simple problems. Um, for many years now, computers – outplay humans at, at chess and now go, right? In chess, combinations of humans and computers are beating the human experts and beating the computer experts. And again, this is changing a little bit as time goes on. But somehow, a group of people together seem to sometimes have a capability that the individuals don't to solve problems, do things. But it kind of requires the computer helping them find each other, know each other, um, Again, if I just had – look at a chat group and say who's proposing what move in chess, that's not very helpful. If I had something that says, you know, there's 200 people out there and here's, you know, the different moves that are being proposed and here's how many people are proposing each one and here's a few comments that the guy who you think of as an expert is saying, now suddenly I'm able to, to think about a new kind of society, quote unquote, which is this combination. And, and more and more – as this AI stuff gets more powerful, you start even thinking about the computer being more of a participant in that and less of just an infrastructure. Yeah. And we discuss all three of those um, 
with kind of the goal of helping people understand what the capabilities of, of computers are, what the capabilities of humans are, and why the pairing is important. So, uh, Jim, in your book, Social Machines, you use healthcare as an example to help readers you know, better understand the kinds of technologies that are being used now and not too in the distant future. Um, doctors face an impossible challenge, as you point out. Every year, new medical knowledge grows. How can emerging computer technologies, AI or social machines, how do they help doctors in this area? Yep. And, of, of course, that's a very active question both yeah, in research and development. In, in fact, um, I'm currently funded by IBM for something called the Cognitive Horizons Network. It's called the HEALS Center, Health Empowerment by Analytics, Learning, and Semantics, really, by applying these powerful AI technologies. And that's a very big area. People all over this. We're really looking at exactly this issue of what are some of the ways that patients can better find the information they need? Clinicians can find things that will help them with their patients and researchers find. And clearly, the same information needs to go to those people in very different ways. So someone who is researching cancer genomics needs to know a lot of detail. Someone who is treating a patient who's kind of recovered, has gone through the process and now is just in remission but is getting their yearly, you know, checking on things, needs to know are there danger signals that have been discovered recently. That and the patient themselves need to know are their behavioral wellness is sometimes used. So we're talking terms like precision medicine. How do we get the medicine all the way down to the individual? And precision wellness is a term that uh, some of the people in IBM's Watson Health Group use to talk about, you know, how do we make it so we, we figure out how you can improve your own health? And all of that is based on all of this information coming from data, coming from medical publications, coming from things like that, which is overwhelming for a human to try to process. So the question is, how do we find the right kind of information to get to the appropriate kind of person in the right kind of ways from all of these different things? And what are the different ways different people might need to interact with that? That's kind of prelude to the question you were really asking. So how do you really put it together? And, and you mentioned it before. We talked about the fact that you know there are these literally millions of papers written a year in science. Many, many, the preponderance are in medical. Um, and you know, your doctor, there may be something in one of those papers that if your doctor had read it, might have made him suspicious about something in your situation, not necessarily have solved a problem. So it's not that we want the computer to read those things and say, what's wrong with this patient, which was kind of the, a model that a lot of people still think is kind of a, a goal, but it's not what we're seeing. What we're really seeing is that um, if the computer can help the doctor see some possibilities that they might miss, note some things, and if the doctor is really the decision maker, using their knowledge of, you know, patients, people, things like that, then, then, then together there may be some power that neither of them alone has. Again, that can be a patient working with information on the web. That could be a doctor working with the patient and information, or it could be the researcher. And, and so just to give you an example from the book, we, we, we use a case of something that I came across totally by accident. I was did three or four studies, and in all of them, it, it turned out that skin infection was an important aspect of something really bad that happened to someone. So I was looking for something to put in the book, and I said, no. Oh. I'll go looking about skin infection. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I don't know this stuff. Turns out that there have been that literally thousands of papers written about skin inf infection since the early 1900s, most of which were written in the past five years, a big chunk of which in the past few years have been identifying that it, ha that it, it, it correlates well with some autoimmune situation. And then in certain mutation situations, it actually can be a indicator of a, a serious leukemia. Now, now, one in a very, very small number of people who came to the doctor with skin infection has a leukemia, mm -hmm. right? Uh, another thing that often um, correlates with that skin infection is anemia. So you come in 
with iron deficiency. So if you come in with iron deficiency, any doctor in the world is going to give you iron pills. If the doctor knows that there are these other things that could conceivably be going on, maybe they would say to you, but you know, given your set of symptoms, take the iron pills. And if you're not getting relief, maybe you want to come back in a month rather than call me in six months or a year, right? Um, or maybe the doctor is going to decide, you know, I know this patient really well and they're really a worrier and they're going to go find out about this. So maybe I'll have them – I'll do this test even if it might be a little bit expensive or intrusive just for the peace of mind in this patient. Whereas in some other patient, I'm like – I know that person doesn't need that. So, so again, um, if you have a medical condition, very often your doctor is deciding which of several mm -hmm. alternatives to offer you. And, and the computer is good at sort of the math of those alternatives, but not at the human part. So, so again, we're back to that. The doctor has intuition, training, ability to bring in information from things outside medicine. But the computer has the ability to read those millions of documents and say, hey, maybe this is something you need to know. Um, maybe we can display the d data in a different way so that when you look at this patient, you realize there's something unusual mm -hmm compared to some of the other patients you've done. And, and, and that's the kind of thing, you know, in a, in a sense, a lot of people say an older doctor is better from the point of view of the human side and a younger doctor is better from the point of view because they went to med school recently so they have recent knowledge. And the question is could the human and the computers working together make it so all those doctors yeah. have some of both in a sense? And that's where I was going to the next question was like how does interface technology need to change – in order for humans to be – to have a more symbiotic relationship with the machine. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So, so, the, um, so in the book, one of the things we go through is some of the difference between how humans understand language and computers understand language. And we use a lot of examples of ambiguity, mm -hmm. right, where <clears throat> the, the structure of language really doesn't – Tell, it tells you some stuff, but it doesn't. So I, I, I use a famous uh, example. There's a sign near a prison in uh, New Mexico that says, uh, hitchhikers may be fleeing convicts or something similar to that. So should you pick them up? <laughs> right? Well, gee, I should pick them up. They're running away from the convicts. Or no, I shouldn't pick them up. They're convicts who are fleeing. Now, now from, from your world knowledge, you would say, OK, hitchhikers may be fleeing convicts. I shouldn't pick them up. If I say refugees may be fleeing, uh, you know, war, then the answer is, wait, I just – the words are in the same relation, but but the implication, I should help them, right? My, I'm not trying to help the war. I'm trying to help the, the refugee, right? And, and where in the other case, it's I'm not going for the – we somehow have knowledge about that stuff. We have also can make decisions about some of the consequence levels and things like that. If something would really have a big impact, we may think about it much harder than if it's something doesn't really matter much. Uh, what am I having for breakfast this morning? Gee, I'm out of cereal. All right, I'll grab this other thing versus, uh, you know, hey, uh, what am I doing to treat this cancer patient? <laughs> Maybe I really want to make sure I get that right, that kind of thing. So, so – Putting these things together, understanding that, and unfortunately, the computer right now um, really doesn't understand language. Can't handle those kind of ambiguities. It's back to that context issue before. We're doing way more than we used to at both understanding the speech part. So we could get a transcript of this conversation now done by a computer, and it would be pretty accurate. Whereas even two, three years ago, wouldn't do very well and getting better and better all the time. Um, and why is that? Because I, I totally – that's coming. That that's coming. That's coming very much out of that deep learning technology is, okay, or okay. and some other tech, other database technologies. Okay. But we're taking what we know about how to do speech stuff on the signal. But now we have so much data. We have all these – so Siri has had mm -hmm. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands, millions of people talking to it giving it examples of speech and it has responded and the person has either said good in a sense by taking the advice or not. So Siri in a sense can say, hmm, I didn't get that right. Put it back in the hopper, right? Things like that. So so more and more data make these things better and better and we now have these technologies of how to do it and enough computer power. So, so 
uh, this neural technology, this brain-like technology, right? 30 years ago, there was a burst of this stuff. But the real problem was there just wasn't enough computer power to solve big problems with it. And new techniques got invented during that time. But then as computer power has caught up with the needs, now we can – deep learning is done by doing these very complex things with millions of things. And they run on the most powerful computers we have today. It can take weeks till they you know, get their – get trained to where they're really doing well. But then they're doing incredibly well. Mm-hmm. What's the promise of social machines? Well, again, I think the – The real promise is that a lot of the problems that face us as society at the big scale, climate change, fresh water usage, um, land use, I mean, on and on and on, all of these things. So if you look at the UN's list of, you know, the hundred problems that they'd like to solve, poverty, health issues, all of those things are very hard, can't be solved by like, you know, it's not... One set of medical specialists will work on this area and suddenly they'll have the miracle cure. You could imagine that for a particular disease. Even there, you tend to have big groups. But you know, when you talk about these big societal changes and things like that, we're looking at a world where a lot of hard problems become kind of existential threats. And those existential th- – you know, some people say the existential threat is using the AI. I think the existential threat is ignoring the AI that could help us potentially realize that that the idea that this guy is proposing over here for climate sequ- – for, for carbon sequestration could actually work if, he, if you use this approach that this guy is doing. But you'd have to sort of build this kind of broker that these guys are talking about. And they're all in different places, not even aware of each other, right? If you can start getting that kind of network effect, that's when we really might be able to start finding new ways to attack some of these big problems. And again, we think it needs that. Humans doing the creative and context-dependent part, Mm -hmm. computer doing a lot of that, bookkeeping, interacting, but now becoming smarter and smarter about you know, maybe these things go together and not so much solving the problem but bringing together the community that can solve it and that would be a big deal. Jim, would you tell us more about your role as director of the Institute for Data Exploration and Applications? Yeah, so at Rensselaer Polytechnic RPI, we're we're actually looking at a very different approach to how to bring some of these technologies, the AI, the data science, et cetera, to the campus. Mm -hmm. And where a lot of groups have created an institute that pulls the data scientists together as a new department, we're really saying every scientist, every engineer, every architect, every social scientist, the business people, all of them need the power of data, machine learning, and this AI technology. So what we created is sort of a virtual institute that that with tentacles out to all of the campus trying to do it. And then we have centers within that. So I mentioned that we have the health uh, empowerment center that IBM funds. We have several other centers that are coming from government and things like that. And we're really trying to sort of therefore help people form these groups. So, So while we wait for the AI to get to where it can do the network effect of bringing people together, we're trying on campus to find ways to bring people together to solve these bigger problems, to really face the global challenges and kind of where these technologies are applied by creating things that break down the traditional academic barriers. And we sometimes use the term the new polytechnic to mean the polyform, right? It's not chemist or biologist or physicist or engineer. It's all of those together solving bigger problems. Be sure to join me next time on the Business of Government Hour TV for another informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving government effectiveness. Until then, it's businessofgovernment.org.